Chapter 23, Disorders of Ventilation and Gas Exchange, or all the respiratory diseases that you will see in the hospital. So it's important uh, in our ability to assess respiratory failure so that we can prevent emergency situations. Um, most of the disease processes that we're going to talk about in this chapter um, are of a chronic nature and have a slow onset and can be dealt with. But in the cases of respiratory failure, we want to know that um, you can understand the signs and symptoms that you're seeing because the earlier that we address um, treatment of respiratory failure and um, hypoxia, the better the outcomes are. So this is just an overview of the different kinds of causes of respiratory failure. Um, we can have hypoventilation and that hypoventilation um, or slower, uh, less deep ventilation uh, results in an in, in increase in CO2 retention and hypoxia. So we have an increase in the CO2, which creates an acidic um, environment, and we have less oxygen being delivered to the tissues. Um, these kinds of hypoventilation disorders can be caused by uh, a depression of the respiratory center, um, because of diseases of respiratory nerves or muscles, or uh, thoracic cage disorders, um, such as pneumothorax. Another cause of respiratory failure can be a ventilation perfusion mismatching, and we've talked a little bit about how that can occur in previous chapters. And lastly, um, another cause of respiratory failure can be um, it, the impaired diffusion, um, where you will get a hypoxemia, but not a hypercapnia. So basically, you have a, a lessening of the ability to transfer oxygen to the blood, um, but you're not having that, that um, decrease in the ventilation, which increases the CO2 that gets kept in the body. Think of impaired diffusion um, diseases um, such as ARDS, um, in interstitial fibrotic lung disease, uh, pulmonary edema, or pneumonia. Hypoxemia means that we don't have enough oxygenation in our blood, and this results in a, a uh, results in cyanosis, which can be central or peripheral. Um, it it negatively impacts and impairs the function of our vital centers. Now, um, one of the earliest signs and symptoms of um, a decrease in oxygenation is um, a uh, change in level of consciousness. Now, the ideas that you're seeing here with agitation, combative behavior, impaired judgment, convulsions, delirium, these are all late changes. So think of um, the early changes of impaired oxygenation as uh, confusion, um, a dulling of uh, response time, um, and it's important that we try and look at this earlier. Um, if you have activation of compensatory mechanisms taking place, um, be that the sympathetic nervous system being activated to increase respiration so that we can get more blood to the body, then we're looking at later signs and symptoms. In chronic hypoxemia, you will see that the respiratory rate becomes faster. Um, so the body resets its homeostasis and has um, a, a faster respiratory rate. You will see an increased production of red blood cells or polycythemia. Uh, 
um, because the kidneys are releasing, releasing more erythropoietin to produce more red blood cells to carry more oxygen. Um, but again, some of the earliest signs and symptoms of respiratory um, oxygenation depredation have to do with changes in the level of consciousness. In terms of um, diagnostically, um, of course, uh, we can take um, arterial blood gases, which will tell us what the oxygen saturation rate, but a non-invasive way of monitoring um, oxygenation is through the SpO2 monitor. Um, and we can see subtle changes in the peripheral SpO2 um, delivery um, through that mechanism. In order to treat, we need to find the underlying disorder to correct, um, but oxygenation via um, nasal cannula or mask is also um, an additional treatment for hypoxia. Hi, excuse me, hypoxemia. Hypercapnia is when we have too much um, CO2 in the blood. Really, it, it um, creates a respiratory acidosis, which increases respiratory um, drive and respiratory um, mechanics, so you have an increased respiratory rate. Um, increased levels of carbon dioxide in the blood have a different response on the nerve firing, creating a depression. So again, you're going to see um, most, um, most prevalently, you're going to see as in the early stages, a disorientation or a, 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 a oversleepiness, um, and you're going to respond to that to figure out what's going on. Um, hypercapnia usually occurs in disorders of hypoventilation and ventilation perfusion mismatching. Um, and it has widespread effects throughout the body because if we're, if we're creating a respiratory acidosis, the body's going to try and balance that through the use of our kidneys, um, our pH, um, and our cardiovascular system. The treatment for this is to decrease that work of breathing and try and improve that ventilation perfusion balance. Um, generally, this will require some sort of um, mechanical intervention from us, whether that be um, putting a patient on the ventilator or um, having IPPB treatments to help improve um, getting rid of the, cardi the carbon dioxide in the body. Disorders of lung inflation include, include pleuritis, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, and atelectasis. Now we went from, uh, on this slide, uh, least life-threatening to most life-threatening. Um, oh, no, we didn't. Oh, sorry, take that back. Pneumothorax would be the most life-threatening. Um, it is an emergency. Um, pleural effusion just means we have either blood, pus, or serous material in our um, interstitial spaces, which is not good. It, it creates a situation where we can't diffuse oxygen to our tissues. Same with, um, uh, same with a pneumonia. Um, atelectasis would be the um, beginning stages where our alveoli just aren't inflating as much as they should be. And that can happen with just one day of bed rest. Um, generally, we diagnose these disorders using chest x-rays. Um, occasionally, we may resort to an ultrasound or a CT scan to see more detail. Um, if you have pleural effusion, we would use thoracentesis to treat it, take that fluid off. Um, we might, um, we would insert a chest tube uh, for drainage. We also might, will insert a chest tube to resolve the pneumothorax situation. Um, and in terms of atelectasis, which is an incomplete expansion of the lung or a portion of the lung, um, we would use 
um, simple things like deep breathing and your um, three ball uh, device that you use at the bedside. One of the ways that we treat atelectasis is by treating the underlying cause and that means we get them up and out of bed, we deep breathe and change body positions frequently and last but not least if necessary we uh, administer O2. Pneumothorax again is that uh, emergency situation where um, air enters the pleural cavity. Now if we have an open um, pneumothorax where we have some sort of trauma that has opened that airway, uh, that, that space up, um, restricting the lung expansion. Um, it's not as severe as if we have a tension pneumothorax, which means um, this air entering the pleural cavity has happened without having an external trauma. Both of these situations affect both the cardiac and the respiratory function. Um, the goal here would be to um, make sure that we can uh, fix the partial uh, collapse of the lung or the uh, re, re expansion of a lung. Um, there's lots of pain uh, associated here. Um, we have an increase in respiratory rate. Um, a difficulty or shortness of breath, and an asymmetrical chest rise. Those are the signs and symptoms that we'll see. In a tension pneumothorax or a severe, um, uh, a severe uh, situation, you'll see a mediastinal shift, meaning um, your trachea will shift away from midline and away from the side that is um, affected with the pneumothorax. Um, and at that point, you're going to see additional signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, um, tachycardia, um, cyanosis, and you may even have a subcutaneous emphysema, which is air in the tissue. So if you touch the tissues, it kind of sounds like those uh, popping bubbles. We diagnose um, both of these conditions in terms of using a chest x-ray. Um, blood gases will, will also give us significant information and uh, lowering SpO2 also. We treat this by inserting a chest tube or doing a needle decompression if it's a tension pneumo um, and we apply uh, supplemental oxygenation until the lung uh, function has returned. Just a nice picture. So now we get into the, the heavy duty disease processes that we see in the hospital every single day. Um, bronchial asthma, chronic obstructive airway diseases or COPD, um, where we have um, emphysema, um, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, and sometimes people put cystic fibrosis in that. Um, in that uh, category, we're going to think of cystic, fi cystic fibrosis as a separate disease process. Um, these obstructive diseases limit airway flow. Um, it affects autonomic nervous system control of the muscles. Um, uh, the parasympathetic system is involved in terms of the vagus nerve and cholinergic receptors, so um, in, causing increased bronchoconstriction. The sympathetic nervous system is usually involved, um, causing bronchodilation, depending on which disease we're talking about. Um, and know that histamine can influence um, the muscles in these cases, causing constriction. So asthma being um, one of the most frequently seen um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders, um, we have asthma that 
can be extrinsic, meaning a topic, meaning there's some sort of a type 1 hypersensitivity. Um, and, and these, uh, think of this as an exaggerated response to stimuli where the inflammatory response um, causes an ac acute response within 10 to 20 minutes and um, creates um, severe bronchoconstriction um, that restricts airflow. Um, the incidence of extrinsic um, asthma is two times greater in boys than girls. Um, affects about 22 million children and um, the contributing factors would be a genetic predisposition to allergies and um, significant environmental exposure. The signs and symptoms that we see with asthma would be an airflow obstruction, um, a bronchial hyper-responsiveness, um, and or swelling. So you're going to see wheezing on expiration, um, chest tightness, um, which is worse at night and in the morning when the fluids are present because of that recumbent position of sleeping all night. Um, you're going to see increased use of accessory muscles, uh, a difficulty breathing, and a fatigue. Um, the, it's really, really hard to breathe. Um, this type of asthma can be exacerbated by exercise um, or exercise can be the extrinsic trigger. Um, how do we diagnose? Um, pulmonary function tests. Um, you don't need to memorize all the different kinds of pulmonary function tests, but know that with asthma, we expect to see alterations in the expiratory volumes. Um, we can also look to blood work to see that there is increased IgE in the blood uh, cells. Um, CBCs will have a high eosinophil eosinophil re uh, response uh, count. Um, chest x-ray will show um, hyperinflation, um, blood gases will show hypoxemia, and generally with um, patients that have a topic asthma, we will do some sort of um, skin testing for allergen specificity so that we can understand what those triggers might be. Um, the treatment um, for asthma is one, uh, control and identify the triggers and prevent exposure. Um, sometimes we do desensitization, desensitization, excuse me, desensitization of um, these uh, patients to their triggers. Um, we may, or we will definitely put them on some sort of medication um, according to the category of what's going on with them. So they may have bronchodilators, anti-inflammatory inhalants. Um, they will have a long-term um, inhaler versus a quick MDI inhaler um, so that we can um, treat this uh, quickly as well as um, uh, in a long-term manner. Um, at when they come in in acute distress, oxygen therapy is usually administered, and if very severe, um, such in cases where somebody has underlying asthma and then gets a respiratory infection, mechanical ventilation may be needed. Um, corticosteroids um, are most important for long-term medication um, for these patient groups, um, we usually augment that with bronchodilators and um, potential um, anticholinergic blocking medications. Intrinsic asthma is basically asthma that is um, linked to um, 
different kinds of um, exposures, um, or sometimes we even uh, have intrinsic asthma being sparked by emotional um, triggers. The airway obstruction in, in asthma looks like this. Nice high level concept now. Well, other chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disorders. Um, emphysema is what we most think about when we're talking about COPD. Um, and this is, um, these cause progressive and recurrent airway obstruction over time. Um, COPD disorders are the fourth leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. And the most common cause of COPD is smoking. Um, secondary causes um, or predisposing factors have to do with um, occupational exposure or environmental exposure um, and asthma. Bronchitis is an obstruction of the um, smaller airways where you have increased mucus production and chronic productive cough. Emphysema is destruction of the alveoli and lung tissue and bronchiectasis is inflammation in, and infection of the smooth muscle of the airways causing permanent dilation. These are the basic mechanisms of, of COPD, which we talked about. Um, the biggest issue has to do with the loss of alveolar tissue, which decreases the surface area for gas exchange. Um, again, uh, the uh, elastic lung fibers become uh, more rigid, causing um, episodes of airway collapse or obstructed exhalation. Um, so in COPD, you have uh, uh, air trapping um, through a variety of mechanisms. So a lot of times we talk about emphysema uh, or COPD in terms of pink puffers and blue bloaters. So uh, emphysema would be your pink puffer. Um, we know that there's an increased neutrophil uh, count due to um, this... Uh, inflammatory process that's taking place and that that can damage alveoli in the long term. In general, pink puffers um, have a loss of lung elasticity, um, abnormal enlargement of air spaces below the bronchioles, and destruction of the alveolo alveoli walls and capillary beds. This results in a hyperinflation of the lungs and increases, increases total lung capacity. So the signs and symptoms that we see are barrel chestedness, and, and in the next slide that we show, we'll see a barrel chest. Well, let's go there now. Um, barrel chestedness, um, and um, we call that an increased um, anterior posterior diameter. So you can see that the lungs are hyperinflated and it, we're having trouble getting um, airway air out be, because of the destruction of the alveoli, but also because of the um, alteration in the chest diameter. Uh, diameter. Um, the lungs don't collapse. The, the muscles and the um, rib cage don't collapse enough to get the air out. Um, in chronic bronchitis or a blue bloater, we see a chronic irritation of the airways, um, an increase in the number of mucus cells with hypersecretion and a productive cough. Think of it in terms of diagnosis of a cough for greater than three consecutive months, and that's a productive cough, or over two years in time. Um, pulmonary function tests show an increased residual volume, meaning air trapping again, a decreased vital capacity, meaning we can't increase the, our ability for our lungs to work. And in our blood gases, we're going to see um, decreased oxygenation and increased CO2 retention. <laughs> 
when we do a sputum culture on these, this hyper, this um, hyper secretion of mucus, we see uh, a large amount of neutrophils and a potential for microorganism growth. Um, signs and symptoms uh, of this disease increase over time leading to, uh, at some point in time, fatigue, exercise, intolerance, uh, a morning cough and sputum production, shortness of breath, uh, frequent upper respiratory infections, um, and as we get really bad, we may see um, fluid retention in right heart, right-sided heart failure. Pink puffers versus blue bloaters. Um, pink puffers usually are emphysema, blue bloaters are usually chronic bronchitis. Um, and these are some of the differences between what we do and what we see. Um, in terms of treatment, we want to try and help get the air out. So pursed lip breathing helps uh, increase our ability to get air out. Um, some of the other treatment nursing interventions that we might do is um, look at workload and distribute workload differently. So what that means is um, I need to adjust uh, or we need to help the patient adjust their exercise uh, expenditures by following them with periods of rest, particularly um, upper arm, any upper arm work. So think about feeding yourself. So after they eat, they should have a significant recovery time because just the exercise of eating um, and swallowing and using their upper arms creates an exercise intolerance. Another treatment that we can use is tripod positioning to improve the use of the accessory muscles to help push the air out. Um, generally, these patients come into the hospital um, with cyanosis, hypercapnia, hypoxemia, and our job is to treat those um, by administering oxygen and correcting the underlying issue. Um, core pulmonar is a severe um, uh, situation resulting in increased pulmonary vasoconstriction, um, which increases the pulmonary artery pressure which increases the work of the right ventricle and um, results in a peripheral edema by creating hypertrophy in the heart. We diagnose, diagnose core pulmonar by pulmonary function tests where we see the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Um, we also see in their lab tests, as noted before, polycythemia. Um, we know that um, these respiratory disorders um, negatively impact the nutritional status of our patients um, and that their CO2 retention from the uh, ABGs. Treatment involves smoking cessation if they continue to smoke. Um, these patients uh, benefit significantly from pulmonary rehab um, programs where they learn to live with their chronic disease and manage their exercise tolerance um, within their limits um, by teaching them energy conservation and workload simpli simplification. Um, it is very important for our uh, COPD patients to get immunized for flu and uh, pneumococcal pneumonia because they are at-risk patients. In terms of medications, these Patients um, survive on inhaled bronchodilators, corticosteroids for acute exacerbation, and oxygen therapy um, over the years that may increase. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a um, genetic disease that... Um, is a recessive disorder passed along to the child that um, prevents uh, chloride transport in the proteins. 
Um, so it creates high concentrations of sodium chloride in the sweat um, and uh, results in um, a, a decrease in the sodium and water uh, concentrations throughout the body, particularly in the respiratory system, um, in the pancreatic system. So mucus becomes thicker. Um, that thick uh, mucus obstructs the airways and the pancreatic and biliary ducts. This is um, diagnosed in children um, and uh, it is now, uh, it used to be considered a death sentence, but now it's considered a chronic disease process um, where we um, test at birth, uh, doing a sweat test, looking for a high sodium chloride, um, and in newborn screening, we look for trypsinogen. Um, it is a slow progression for secondary organ dysfunction, um, where the lungs and the pancreas are the two biggest uh, organs involved, um, creating insufficiency in both. Um, we treat the symptoms by doing chest physiotherapy and um, pulmonary function tests and mucolytic agents to uh, improve the respiratory capacity of these patients. Because of the pancreas uh, involvement, um, we also understand that these um, children uh, with cystic fibrosis have an inadequate ability to digest fats and proteins. And so you will see, um, uh, because of the work of their breathing and this lack of processing normal nutrition, you'll see these um, patients as thin and um, having altered nutrition less than. Just a nice high level overview of what happens in cystic fibrosis. And now, last but not least, we'll talk about some of the disorders of pulmonary um, circulation. Uh, that would be embolism, hypertension, um, and we're going to focus on mostly the pulmonary embolism being the um, emergency uh, sign, the emergency uh, disease process. Uh, pulmonary embolism. Signs and symptoms will depend on the size of the emboli and where the emboli actually um, lodges. Um, you will see an acute breathlessness and tachycardia with chest pain, a bottoming out or hypotension um, of the blood pressure, um, neck vein distension because of the increased um, pressure, cyanosis, and diaphoresis. This is, I'm fine and talking to you one minute, I'm acutely breathless the next minute. We diagnose this usually with um, lung scans. Um, uh, we will also take blood gases to find out how bad it is, but the lung scan is going to tell us um, where uh, the embolus is, and we're going to treat this with thrombolytic therapy, anticoagulant therapy for the long term, low molecular weight heparin, if I want to prevent pulmonary embolism, pul early ambulation is one of the um, most non-invasive things that I can do. And um, intermittent pressure device compression stockings are also standard um, anti-pulmonary embolism devices. Pulmonary edema would be another one of the signs and symptoms or another one of the um, acute uh, distress um, diseases that occur. Um, pulmonary edema is a common complication of cardiac disorders. This is where we have an accumulation of fluid in the extravascular spaces of the lung. We can, this can be happen as a chronic or an acute onset. Um, it is definitely related to left-sided heart failure. 
um, caused by cardiomyopathy, hypertension, or valvular disease. Um, the signs and symptoms are dyspnea on exertion, um, orthopnea, uh, you may see mild tachypnea and increased blood pressure, um, and it, lung sounds will have crackles. As the hypoxia increases, um, it affects the heart, so you may hear a diastolic S3 gallop. You will see arrhythmias, um, a tachycardia, and cold, clammy skin, and cyanosis um, due to the hypotension and thready pulse that occurs. We diagnose by um, doing ABGs, and you will see um, significant hypoxia. The chest x-ray will show diffuse haziness of the lung fields, um, potentially a cardio, uh, cardiomegaly, an enlarged heart, um, may show pleural infusion. Um, your SpO2s will be decreased, and um, you may see some arrhythmias in your EKGs. Uh, the goal here is to reduce the extravascular fluid, so we put these patients on fluid restriction. Um, we try and improve the gas exchange and the myocardial function at the same time by administering diuretics um, and positive inotropic agents to increase the contractility of the heart. Um, we might also put them on pressures, uh, presser medications to enhance contractility and vasoconstriction in the peripheral um, vasculature. And if they're having arrhythmias, they may be put on antiarrhythmics to improve that cardiac output. Um, lastly, you may see atrial vasodilators dilators to decrease the peripheral vascular um, resistance, um, but the bottom line is we're trying to get the circulation to work as much like normal, um, and because there's significant um, disease that's permanent in both the heart and the lungs of patients that suffer from pulmonary edema, we must do this through the use of medicines. Core pulmonar is right-sided heart failure secondary to respiratory disease. So our respiratory and cardiovascular systems are significantly linked. Um, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, as we as we treat one or the other, we're affecting both sides. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, is something that we will talk about more as you hit critical care. But you just need to know this is a um, this is a significant, um, deadly uh, respiratory disease um, that takes place generally um, with significant predisposing factors of shock, sepsis, and trauma. It, it is fatal within 48 hours if not recognized and treated. Um, and even if we do recognize and treat it, it has a 50 to 70% mortality rate. These are your patients that are generally in the ICU on um, mechanical ventilation. Um, and we have to support the body through homeostasis um, by supporting that ventilation. If not treated, or the reason that this is so deadly is it usually results in multi-system failure, um, some of the disease processes that can contribute to ARDS would be uh, burns, um, DIC, uh, smoke inhal inhalation, uh, near drowning, and other um, chest trauma and aspiration. Uh, not something we're going to have to really go into in detail for um, our class purposes. Just knowing that ARDS is, is um, an ICU-type disease process will be enough for me and that we need to move fast.